please introduce yourself to this group? Joseph Ritula, husband of all of it. And, and what branch of the service did you serve, Joel? The engineers. Corps of Engineers. That's right. And uh, you were stationed in Europe, is that right? I was stationed in Europe, and I, from there I went to the Pacific. Thank you, Joel. Albert, let's hear from you, please. Would you introduce yourself and tell us what uh, branch of the service you were in? I'm Al Kuhn. I was in the medical section uh, at uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison. <coughs> in fact, I had taught 19 years before they drafted me in the Army. <laughs> I missed by two months and 15 days of being too old to be drafted. <laughs> <laughs> so, they were easy on me. <laughs> I was inducted at Fort Benjamin Harrison. I uh, was given only six weeks basic instead of the usual 12. I took the basic at Fort Harrison didn't have to go where my friend went to Fort Kentucky. I, um, as I said, took my basic in there, and then I was assigned to Fort Harris. I was assigned to the medical section, and uh, I had an office job uh, working for the uh, captain who was uh, in charge of separation classification. I showed movies uh, while I was there. <coughs> the 35 millimeter type to the servicemen, uh, which in that machine used carbon arc light, or carbon arc for light. And, uh, I was surprised when I, uh, well, I also uh, worked, at, worked at night, you know, the boys were in the service, and so they needed people in the factory. So I worked for P.R. Mallory uh, at night, making walkie-talkie batteries. Uh, we, uh, after our day's work, uh, at the base, we got on a bus, rode into Indianapolis, worked, I think, five hours, went back home. The unusual thing happened was that one evening, as I was riding in uh, to work, I was in the GI bus, and some fellow back of me was uh, reading the paper, and the paper kept uh, hitting me in the back of the neck. So I turned around and looked at the back side of the paper. Lo oh, and behold, I see South Marion School burns down. <laughs> so I found it out the same day that it happened. That was in the evening paper of uh, Indianapolis uh, News. Uh, I only lost uh, one school term. I was inducted to the May the 5th. And uh, the war ended August uh, about the 15th of the next year, so I missed one school term of teaching. Came back and taught at North Marion. Uh, well, in fact, uh, I was dismissed from Camp, Camp Atterbury. I arrived home at 8 o'clock Sunday night. At 8 o'clock Sunday morning, I was at school at North Marion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robert. can't choose our time to be born, can we all? Bob Wells, you didn't hold up your hand. Now let's hear from you. Well, I didn't see you. Come on, get up on your feet, please. My name's Bob Wells. I spent three years, one month, and one day in the service. I was a signal corps the Ninth Air Force attached troop car command. And the troop troopers went in, I was the guy that 
the outfit that carried you in and kept you out of work. I think, uh, I know for sure that Joe Petula came mighty close not to being here. Was that an artillery shell or a bomb you ducked, Joe, or what was that? It was They called them 88s. That was, a, that was a German 88 artillery shell, and Joe dove head first into a cellar because he could hear the shell coming, and the man standing next to him didn't make it. In uh, early 1942, I read in Reader's Digest about an army rookie hadn't been in his first camp more than a couple of days, and he was hounding the first sergeant, the company commander, for seven day pass. His wife was going to have a baby. Well, rookies are usually restricted to base for the first 30 days, and then <coughs> With reasonable behavior, they get an eight-hour pass. But this kid persisted, my wife's going to have a baby, I've got to have a seven-day pass. So the company commander considered it and gave him the seven-day pass. And the fellow beat it back to his barracks, grabbed some socks and underwear, and as he's going out the barracks door, one of his pals stopped him and said, when is your wife having the baby? He said, nine months after I get home. <laughs> Reader's Digest. <laughs> Dr. Kenny mentioned this uh, presentation at the Historical Society next Tuesday night. Bail out over the Balkans. You didn't expect to have any homework connection with this course, but I'm going to lay it on you. You owe it to yourselves to either buy this book, and the cost is about the cost of printing, or get it from the library, or go down to the Historical Society Tuesday night and hear every word of that story. I promise you, there's a hundred times more to that story than was presented here last Thursday night. That's your homework assignment. <laughs> I wanted to explain to these younger people here, college students, <coughs> that the balance of this series will be an attempt to show the personal side of war. Uh, you can sit in on all sorts of history classes in school. You can see all sorts of authoritative documentaries on television and so forth, but there's a personal side that we are trying to present. You must not construe that any of us who are participating in this program are heroines or heroes. We're just average people that happen to be on hand at that time. And you young people today would go through the same things and face the same situations we did if the occasion Happen. So place yourselves in that time period. Before the United States entered the war, there's some chairs up here, folks. Come right in. Come in and get seated. That's all right. You won't, yeah. you won't disturb a thing. Yeah. Why don't you introduce Norm since he's going to be a speaker for us? Well, come on in, will you, Norm? We're taking off for Nova Scotia tomorrow morning, and we're going to be away. I want to see how you're representing the program. Well, uh, I'd like to introduce sir, uh, you to everybody, Norman. This is Norman Muller. He's been a Rensselaer taxpayer for what, eight right. years? And uh, he is also a World War II veteran. Um, we'll be hearing from him later. He served in the infantry under General Mark Clark in the uh, Indian, uh, yeah. Italian yeah. campaign, not the Indian War, the Italian <laughs> campaign. <laughs> Glad to see you here tonight, Norm. Good to be here. Before the United States was involved in World War II, there was a very close 
connection between Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt. And naturally, all Americans were vitally concerned with what was going on in the European theater. The Russians were taking a terrible pasting. I think they lost something like 10 million people in the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, the United States was sending a great deal of aid to Britain. Bundles for Britain was one thing. And so there was a lot of close communication between Churchill and Roosevelt. And those two men foresaw a, an, a military advantage if the United States would concentrate on the war in Europe first. This was after Pearl Harbor. They reached this decision. Then all the Allied forces sweep in to the Pacific. And they thought they could make short order out of the Japanese if it was handled that way. So in our series, we're going to cover the campaigns in Africa and Europe first, Italy, France, Belgium, Holland, right on across Germany. And then we will move to the Pacific. So these first few series will be primarily targeting that theater of operation. Our participants tonight are two women from the military service. And let me point out to you that there were no draft boards pressuring these women. They volunteered, every one of them volunteered to take an active part in the defense or service the United States. There wasn't one of them that volunteered had any idea at all how long she would be expected to serve. Because when at that time when they talked about serving for the duration plus six months, were we looking at eight years? Were we looking at three? Were we looking at twelve? What in the world is this going to, what are we getting into? Is this going to be a lifetime career, for goodness sake? And with that in mind, I have the greatest respect for these ladies who volunteered. And they were shipped to places all over the world. And they endured hardships right along with men. They had to eat army food, for one thing. And I... I can't praise them enough. Tonight I would first like to introduce Doris Schreiner, who was a member of the Women's Auxiliary Corps. Doris, uh, will you take over, sir? they thought this kid will go home, think about it, and never show up again. 
what this kid did. I went to Indianapolis for my enlistment in July and reported to Des Moines, Iowa for basic training in October. We were often asked why we would volunteer when we were not obligated to serve. And there were many reasons, and each girl had her own. But the reasons were similar, and among them, as corny as it may have sounded then, and as corny as it may sound to you tonight, patriotism had much to do with it. The GIs used to say, somebody must have hit you over the head with a flag, and in a sense, I guess they did. Jerry Hoover quoted from what the men sang, so I will quote from some of the women. There was a song, part of which said, we're here to do our part. Without a cannon, without a gun, we're fighting with our hearts. And basically, that's what the women did. In 1943, uh, we, as were most of the WAAC, were sent to Camp Pope, Louisiana for revaluation and reassignment. They tested us for everything they could think of, physical, mental, emotional, aptitude, attitude, security, what have you. And the rumor was that they were choosing a group for an overseas company. Well, the Army always did that. They always said, we're choosing the cream of the crop even if they were making you queen of the latrine. <laughs> and I remember, though, my first day when I was moved to another part of the camp and to a barracks away from the girls I had been with. And I sat on my cot, and I eyeballed those girls, and I thought cream of the crop alone. They didn't select me. They called me out with the rest of these rejects. <laughs> First of all, it was this clumsy girl, big feet, had this petite hat on, and she reminded me of how you see these horses with their ears sticking out of the hat. And I thought, that's got to be retarded. <laughs> then there was this southern gal. And I thought, I figured if I ever saw one, She's probably prejudiced against everybody and mostly Northerners. And then there was this people, this Eastern debutante. And I thought, huh, she just joined the Army because she thought it was the glamorous social thing to do. Probably don't intend to break a fingernail. Well, that was my lesson. And don't jump to conclusions and don't judge people by first appearances. That retarded one, Virginia, happened to have a degree in engineering. <laughs> she could not only tell you how to build a bridge, she could tell you where the weak points were to blow it up. <laughs> and that bigot, that prejudiced person, Mary Gale, to this day only has one fault. Mary Gale ain't got no sense. I keep telling her, Mary Dale, you'll never get to hell that way. The devil won't let you in. But she still don't have any sins. And that baby Todd, that wasn't going to get a fingernail broken, was like a sister to me. When I worked long hours, uh, Carol would, when she pressed her shirts, she pressed mine. When she pressed her skirts, she pressed mine. And in the mornings, she would take my mess kit with hers to the mess hall and bring me back my breakfast so I could sleep later. She was my sister. How wrong I had been in my judgment of those girls who became a part of my Army family and my lifelong friends. From Camp Polk, we were sent to Fort Devon, Massachusetts for further training among which was a lot of first aid, survival, and self-defense. We were taught judo, which I still remember incidentally. One of the things they wanted to be sure we knew how to do 
was to swim. Well, I came from Dumont, Indiana, where swimming pools were few if existing at all, and the Kankakee River was too dangerous to learn to swim in, and the Hodge Ditch where the boys swam, they also skinny dipped. I didn't have much chance to learn to swim. Well, we sent home for our swimsuit, since the Army don't furnish swimsuits. And mine came before my friend Michaelina. Well, Michaelina sat on the shore, and she was my moral support, or so I thought. She, oh, Swanky, you're doing good. Now you're doing it. Now you're getting it. That's good. Michaelina's suit came. Michaelina put it on, Michaelina marched to the lake, and Mar Michaelina hid behind a tree. And she never got her feet wet, said, I'm getting in that dirty water. So I may still drown her for that. <laughs> <coughs> From Fort Devon, we, uh, well, among the things that we were taught in Fort Devon was how to pack our gear, which had consisted of two duffel bags, a musette bag, which we called a musette bag, but it was like a backpack. And you had three blankets, gas mask, and everything else you owned. Well, you learned to pack those two duffel bags very carefully. You put one blanket in each duffel bag, and the third blanket you rolled and put over your musette bag, and you learned to stick everything down in there so you could reach right down and pick it up without unpacking the duffel bag. And our last time to pack that was at Camp Shanks, New York, before we were loaded on the ship. We were on the ship and out to sea about five days when we went down for breakfast. And one of the crew, uh, it was an English ship, so it was uh, an English crew, and he said, uh, we're headed back to New York. And I said, yes, so is your grandma. And he said, no, honest. He said, we got engine trouble. They were hit last night. And we're headed back to New York. He said, you go back up and, we, and you look out your porthole. Well, we had been told that morning, don't open your porthole. So of course, we couldn't wait to do it. And sure enough, instead of this convoy of several ships and there's safety in numbers, there was one little destroyer second back, the only protection we had. <laughs> well, we didn't go to New York. Couldn't have made it, I don't think. But we went, lived into St. John's, Newfoundland. And they take us off the ship with our musette bag, our uh, gas mask, and our one duffel bag over our shoulder like Santa Claus. And they take us, what they said was four miles, up and down the shore, and my legs believed them and they take us to an American camp. They kept us there about a week, during which time the Germans announced that they had sank us. So they put us back on the ship, hopefully to sail, but by that time the Germans had found out they hadn't sank us. So every time we'd start out to meet a convoy, the German submarines had cut us off. And I don't know how many times we tried that. But the last time, the ship was damaged again. And the Navy men would know more about this than I did, but they said we also ran aground. So then the ship was deemed no longer seaworthy. So one day they take us off, and they take us up on what to me was a mountain, but it was the seashore. And there we sit. Well, we're mighty glad this time for that Santa Claus bag over our shoulder because we could lean against it <coughs> through the night. And they fed us K rations, which you guys know is a little better than dog food, but not a whole lot. <laughs> and on the eve of the second day, into port comes this ship flying the beautiful American flag. So they hastily put us on it and hastily dart back out to gain a convoy. What the military had done, since we couldn't get out of there, we tried to catch a convoy going toward England. But what they did was had a convoy coming back from England, <coughs> dart in, pick us up, and dart back out again. 
Well, we didn't still go to New York. <laughs> we went to Nova Scotia, Canada. And we were there a few days. And then we did catch a convoy going toward England again. The second ship was smaller than the first. And so there were nine of us girls in a little bitty cabin. There were three bunks on each side. And that took care of six girls, and I happened to be one of them. Made sure of that. And then the seventh girl had to pull her cot out from under the bunk on one side, and she slept in the walkway. And the eighth girl pulled her cot out from the bunk on the other side, she slept in the bathroom, which was almost as big as the cabin, and the ninth girl had to sleep on blankets in the bathtub. Actually, the boys fared worse than we did. The boys, we had the airborne troops on the ship with us, and they were already, some of them even, from the conditions on the first ship that had not meant for them to bend on them as long as they had been. And then, because the ship was smaller, some of them had to sleep out on the outside deck. And we had sailed in September, but this was October. And the, the uh, ocean was rougher and colder. And when I saw the size of those waves, which washed up on the deck where the boys were, I didn't care that much that I wasn't a good swimmer, because nobody was going to swim in those waves. Us girls, in order to keep from having claustrophobia in that little bitty room, spent a lot of our days out in the hallway, sitting cross-legged, playing a card game similar to solitary, which we called Idiot's Delight, because you had to be an idiot to play it. <laughs> but it kept us entertained. Well, we made it after 50-some days of trying, and two trips across the ocean, actually, we made it safely to Liverpool, England. They took us from truck, we were by truck, from Liverpool to London. And in, in the transit, we, they kept us overnight, and I don't really know where it was, but it was a wooded area, and we slept in tents. And they gave each girl one helmet full of water, not much. With that, you were to brush your teeth, take your bath, and wash your underwear. <laughs> well, Michaelina and I pooled our water. We took out about a half a cup to brush our teeth each. And then we washed in one, rinsed in the other. And I've often said Michaelina Barbario is about the only human being I take a bath with in a helmet full of water. <laughs> <laughs> in London, we were housed in Grosvenor Square. In, to me, there were mansions, but they were nice homes of wealthy people. And I was lucky enough to get in the one that uh, had the um, day room and the mess hall and the company headquarters. And I had a lot of fun exploring that place because it had all of these secret air, uh, stairways and passageways. And in one room, there was a glass case that we decided they had kept their jewelry in. And I looked real careful, because I thought they could have missed one little thing. <laughs> we, uh, Michaelina, Carol, and I, uh, shared a room on the third floor, or on the fifth floor. And we shared a bath with the other girls on that floor. And from our window, we could see the planes coming in, the bombers. And whenever the high park guns went off, we knew it was time to go to the air raid shelter, which was in the basement. And we spent a good many nights rolled up in our blanket on the floor of that basement. The bombs, of course, bothered me, as did the exchange of gunfire on the boats. But actually, I fared better than a lot of the other girls. My being from the country was a help to me because I was accustomed to lightning and thunder and there was a similarity with the bombing raids. And just as I always knew that lightning could hit me, 
I didn't figure it would. And the same way with the bombs. I knew they could hit me, but I didn't figure they would. The thing I think that disturbed me most in the bombings in London was when we would be going to work in the mornings after a raid and passing people digging out their loved ones, especially holding a dead child. I think that has been the hardest memory for me. In London, I'm glad you saw me put that up there for you, Doris. Otherwise, I'd have <laughs> I was keeping an eye on it. <laughs> I'd have it over. In London, we were assigned to uh, the European Theater of Operation USA, which was the American headquarters in Europe. And I was assigned to a colonel, a major, and a captain. And when they set me up with all my equipment, my desk, and my chair, and my file cabinet, and my typewriter, and all this, it was about noon. And the major came in from his lunch. And I'm already sitting there thinking, Doris Marie, you may get all more, you know how to chew here. The Major Wetzel stopped in front of my desk. Now, Major Wetzel was six foot two. And he towered over me when I was standing, and much more so when I was sick. He said, you're our clerk. Now, in the Army, if you did anything in an office, you were a clerk. So I said, yes, sir. He said, how is your typing? And I said, poor. <laughs> and he said, how's your shorthand? I said, worse. <laughs> and he burst out laughing, and he said, good, I'm a field man, not an office man. And he was. He was a field man, not an office man. He couldn't spell worth a darn, and he didn't know a comma from a semicolon. But he and I got along fine, because I, as a corporal, which I was at that time, could ask questions that a major was supposed to know. And he was from Illinois and I from Indiana, so we had that in common. And the colonel, Colonel Hayes, had been retired. And they had called him back to the service because of his knowledge and his experience. And I marveled at his brilliance. He was a sharp man, and I adored him. Now, I will miss the captain. I didn't like him. <laughs> when General Eisenhower uh, moved from Africa to England, several of us were transferred then to the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, SHAPE for short. And we were moved then to Bushy Park. And at Bushy Park, our office was in a clump of trees, but then it was camouflaged. And I, I don't think we fooled the Germans very long, but I thought that was pretty clever. And uh, in Bushy Park, my office was near to General Eisenhower's. I never did walk work directly to General Eisenhower, although part of my work required me to go into his office. We were at Bush Park on D-Day. And what I remember most about D-Day is not what most people would think you would remember, the excitement or the satisfaction or the anticipation. What I remember most about D-Day was the silence, the dead silence. We girls never discussed our work at the barracks, much at all, anyway. But on that night, as we each left our offices, we knew this is it. Operation Overlord, the word is go. But we said not a thing. We got ready, did our little chores to get ready for the next day's work, which we knew would be big, like a bunch of zombies. We said hardly nothing. And we lay in our beds that night. And I'm sure the other girls' thoughts were much the same as mine. Where are my brothers? Where are my cousins? Where are my friends? 
And what part will they have in this? And what effect will it have on our lives afterwards? And like I say, we were on the ship with the Airborne, or the Airborne were on the ship with us. And so we had remained friends with many of them. Some of the girls had even married them. And as the planes began to go over that night, squadron after squadron after squadron, we lay in our beds and we thought, is that his plane? What's he thinking? Is he frightened? And I'm sure we all prayed the same selfish, fruitless prayer, knowing full well that somebody's brother, somebody's cousin, somebody's friend, and somebody's special someone would not come back. As morning came, one of the girls had a radio, and so she tuned it to the British station. And the report came that the invasion of Europe had taken place, that the Allied troops had landed in France. We all hurried off to our offices, as we knew we were expected to do, and in my office, which was the message center of the intelligence division, the messages were coming in so fast and out so fast, we really hardly had time to think. But as the reports of casualties came in, and the airborne and the amphibious troops, the casualties were just enormous. I kept thinking, not mine. Not mine. But they were very bad. The, 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 uh, it was devastating. The, the, the losses. That is the irony of a war. It takes the strong and the brave. It takes the cream and the crop. As soon as, well, I don't know whether it was the first night or the second after D-Day, but soon after, the B-bombs began coming over. And it took a few days for the military to know what they were, because they didn't know whether they were suicide missions, radio-operated, man-operated, or motor-operated. So it took them a few days to figure it out. And they were, they flew low. You could almost see them in the daytime. They were a nuisance. But that the, what we call the ACAC, the aircraft, couldn't, couldn't, was brutal to them. They were so low. So what the system they used on them was that they sent fighter planes out to blow them up before they got across the channel or into, into England. Well, I don't know how many they blew up, but I know they missed a lot of them. And the first night that they came over, we girls were required to sleep in the every shelter that was just outside our, our quarters. After that, it was optional. And I and my <coughs> friends opted for our, the comfort of our barracks and our cots. And if they came close, which very often they did, they'd scatter things or they'd break windows out. They, they, the V-bomb had a little motor on it. And when that motor cut, it might drift quite a ways or it might go directly down. And you never really knew what you was going to do. So it, if it came near, we'd either roll under our cot or we'd roll over on our belly and pull the covers up over our head to protect us from any debris and whatever. Well, this one night, one of those boogers cut right above us. And I rolled over on my belly and pulled the covers up over my head. And my friend Michaelina threw herself right on top of me. Her body would have taken the shock 
in the debris. Luckily, it drifted on, and my Galena got up and got on her own spot. And to this day, she nor I either one of said anything about that. She'd be embarrassed if I did. But I have considered that since she would have given her life for me if she had needed to, I really should forgive her for taking such pleasure in watching me drown with the full death. <laughs> <laughs> At the office, uh, I shared, that, as I say, my, uh, my office was near General Eisenhower. And so we used the same air raid shelter. And I remember the first day at the office that we were required to go to the air raid shelter. Well, some lesser officer insisted that we, according to military protocol, wait until General Eisenhower got into the air raid shelter. Well, General Eisenhower was mad. And you could always tell when General Eisenhower was mad because his ears would turn red on top of his bald head. And he chewed that officer out good. He said, these kids only have one neck too. They go in that door as they come to it. So from then on, we did. And I can remember writing to my parents and telling them, in the air raid today, I sat next to General Eisenhower, and if they'd have come any closer, I'd have sat on his lap. <laughs> But we did. We went in as we came to the door, uh, by order of General Eisenhower. But those darn bombs were a nuisance. It was just imminent danger. Take cover. And you just no more than get to your desk and start to work and concentrate on what you were going to do, and it would be imminent danger. Take cover. So one night, uh, Dusty was a British boy. I worked with more British than American, and I worked with more men than women. There was only one other woman in my office, and that was Nellie O'Connor. So Dusty and I, which was a little British boy, which was like a little brother to me, he was a couple years younger than me. We were finishing up that night, and we'd been to that every shelter I don't know how many times, and you'd think you never would get home. So another imminent danger, take cover. And Dusty looked at me and he said, are you going? And I said, that's not. And I didn't any more than get that out of my mouth until the motor cut. Well, it wasn't, of course, a direct hit, but it hit so close. <laughs> the way the office was there at Bushy Park, the hallway was a cement or brick or something, but all the little offices that were tributary out were like little Quonset huts or prefabs or what. I always said they were pasted together. So this thing lit close enough that the concussion raised the roof and the sides and the ends fell out. <laughs> and the roof come back down. So here's Dusty and I under the table. We crawl out and we rescue the documents, which has always have to be. And luckily the safe wasn't damaged, so we crawled around and got the documents into the safe and anything else to do with the home. The next morning when we came to work, the engineers or the maintenance or whoever was responsible had jacked up the roof and stuck the sides and the end back in and pasted them up. <laughs> <laughs> After we cleaned up the debris while we were ready to go to work, except that in the roof above where my desk was was a big hole. And on the chair where I would have been sitting, was this piece of jagged metal, piece of the bomb. So if the roof hadn't smashed me, which I still had that piece of bomb, if the roof hadn't smashed me, that jagged metal would have played havoc with my head. That's about as close as we came to, to getting her. After France was liberated, we were moved to Versailles, France. And at Versailles, <coughs> Our offices were in the Grand and Petite Trianons. And I was lucky enough to get an office that was heated. Not all of them were. And the office wasn't too bad. But our barracks left the little to be desired. It was like an old fort. And it had been condemned for human use. It had, its last use had been as a horse stable. And it had some lighting, but no heat and no plumbing. Well, what we did for heat, each 
room. Got a little pot bellied stove, and you stuck the stove pipe out the window. And then about once a day, you got a little bucket of fuel, whatever they could find, a few little pieces of coal or pieces of wood, and you'd scavenge what you could from the office, and I never could because they burned all mine. And uh, we'd pick up sticks on the street, but the French people usually beat us to them. And we often said, when we got a package from home, that cardboard box was about as welcome as the contents because <laughs> you'd be burning. But Mary Dell was in charge of, of the stove. So she would, when she made the fire, she'd take my canteen and put it on top of the stove because I worked later hours than most of them. And before she went to bed and before the stove went out, she put my canteen in my bed. Well, for, for plumbing, the Army had built a latrine and a mess hall out in the courtyard of this fort. And as I think back on it, they were mighty close together, too. <laughs> but you had to go outside to take your shower. And this was a double whammy for Nellie and I because we worked late, and by the time we'd get home, most of our water was gone. So we'd go out, take, go out in the cold, take a cold shower, go back in the cold, and whatever heat was from that canteen was sure welcome, even though it wasn't very much. Our greatest concern in France was at, at the time of the Battle of the Bulge, which was for most of the troops over there. I'm sure you know how the, the foot troops were, were in trouble. Um, even though we knew what the ultimate outcome would probably be, there were tense moments. And at one point, uh, there were planes on standby to fly us girls back to England if the Germans' advancement had not been stopped. Luckily, it was. And at the same time as they planned that surge, they made, to correspond with that timing, the dropping of espionage and sabotage, sabotage agents outside of Versailles. Their mission was to find their way into Versailles, to find as much information as possible about the Allies, to cause as much chaos as they could, and if possible, to muster enough strength from sympathetic French, and there were sympathetic French, and from the French Moroccos who were being held in Versailles to overpower our headquarters. <coughs> the reason that their mission was not as successful as they would have liked it to have been was not for want of trial. <coughs> The work, a part of the work, that I did in G2, Intelligence Division, would normally have been done by a commissioned officer. I was not commissioned, one reason being I didn't want to be. I wasn't in the Army for a career, and so my rank didn't make any difference and I would have had to have lived away from the girls that I counted as my dearest friends. And the other reason that I was not commissioned was because had the Germans been successful <laughs> at any time in infiltrating our office or overpowering it, they would never have thought I was doing what I was doing because I looked like exactly what I was. And remember, this was 50 years ago. I looked like exactly what I was. A little country girl straight out of the barn. And they would never have thought I was doing what I was doing. From France, uh, we were there on VD Day. Some of the girls had moved to Reims, but I was still in Versailles. 
VE Day for us was not the same excitement that it was for many people. For us, it was more uh, a sense of, of relief and a sense of satisfaction for a job well done, but a task not completed. Soon after VE Day, we were moved to Frankfurt, Germany. And there again, my office was near General Eisenhower's, and I did see him quite often. He came home to, to the United States after Frankfurt. And we were separated, because I was with the Allied, we were separated into the different countries. And I had to say goodbye to my British boys, which I didn't want to do, because I knew I would never see him again. But we, um, my division, the intelligence division, was uh, made into the U.S. Group Control Council, which was to be the military government of Germany. And we were sent then to Hearst and on to Berlin. The evidence of war <coughs> was present in Frankfurt and in Hearst, but definitely in Berlin. There were blocks and blocks of nothing but rubble. The devastation and the desolation was unbelievable. The people were not only homeless, but they were starving. It wasn't unusual to see an elderly person fall dead in front of you. And you never really knew whether it was from hunger or from lack of medical. They built in Berlin. Our, our billeting wasn't too bad, even if the roof did leak and the windows were broke out and the mosquitoes were all unbearable. But they built a makeshift kitchen or mess hall out in a park like they were actually, it was like a forest. And I never did know why that was involved. But we would go through the chow line. And then you would sit on whatever you could find, the log or the stuff or the ground or whatever. And out of that woods would come people waiting for the scraps from your plate. Or they'd sneak up behind you and steal a plate. And there was a little boy that had a little bucket, like our kids would have a little sand bucket for his sandbox. And the best that I could understand him or he me, because he didn't speak English and I didn't speak German very good, was that he was three years old. And he would take his little bucket and he'd, he'd take everybody's scraps and he'd run back into the woods and then he'd be back with his little bucket again. Well, when he came to me, I reverted to French and I said, c'était vous ici, mon jeune, which I don't speak good French either. But he understood that I meant sit there and eat. And so I would feed him. I wanted to make sure that if he were feeding all those other people, that that little three-year-old baby, and there was no way that I could sit there and feed my fat face, knowing that there were people back there in that woods hungry or starving, and especially a little three-year-old boy. And there were others who felt the same way. So what was happening was we were eating. We were dumping our plates in for the other people to eat. So what they finally did then, the military made the arrangement that after we were through the child line, uh, the civilians could go through the child line. Soon after uh, we were there was BJ Day. And again, BJ Day, of course the Germans could care less. But VJ Day even wasn't the same that I'm sure it was to the people back home. To us, it was a relief, but it was almost a shock. It was a little like running a long race and coming to the end of it. We really don't know what to do now. But soon after VJ Day, I had enough points, and they did point system. I had enough points to be rotated back to the States and discharged. 
So in a matter of weeks, well, in a matter of days, I was transferred from the heart of Berlin to the Mount Indiana, and it was a bit sudden. Coming home was not what I had expected it to be. The attitude of some people toward the women who had been in the military was a surprise to me. There were those who treated us as though we had done something wrong, probably immoral, and they even years after, when I mentioned that I was in the service, I very often get the reaction, oh, you were one of those? Or, well, I certainly wouldn't tell him. <laughs> the, the reception that we women who served in World War II got on coming home was similar to what the Vietnam War receives. Well, your home, behave yourself, and we'll forgive you if you don't talk about it. So we very quickly learned not to talk about it. Rightfully or wrongfully, I am proud of my service, but I would not want my daughters to serve especially in a war. I told this to my friend Carol, who came to visit me about seven years after the war, and she asked me if I had had difficulty adjusting back to civilian life. And I told her, yes, I did, that finding that I had so little in common with the other women of that era was distressful to me. Their topics of conversation were so strange to me. Their gripes or complaints seemed so trivial, and their priorities so different from mine that I felt like I had landed on another planet. It was not easy, and I did not want, as I told Carol, I would not want my daughters to serve in the military because of that awful feeling of always being an oddball, never quite fitting, always being different. And Carol said, I think we were different to start with. And I think that Carol was right. I think the women that volunteered in 1942 served throughout the war in a war zone to 1945 was different to start with. And I am proud of my Army service, rightfully or wrongfully. Some of the experiences <coughs> I could have done with that, but some of them I would not have wanted to miss. And I thank all of you for having enough interest to be here tonight. <coughs> and I'm thankful to those who have this session, especially Bill Wood, for the opportunity to talk about it. It's been 50 years. Thank you. Wonderful story from Bill. Yes. Let's give it again. I think we'll all individually be indebted to her forever. Our uh, second participant tonight is Olga Petula, U.S. Army nurse. And one heck of a great gal. <laughs> Come up here, will you please, all of us? Okay. That's a tough act to follow, Doris. I'll tell you. Great. I'm limping. 
that's not a war wound. <laughs> I fell, broke my hip, but I'm fine. Okay. Hey, nothing can beat the Army Nurse Corps. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you some data first, <clears throat> and I'm a little nervous. I hate to talk to people like this. I'm scared to death of you. <laughs> Uh, okay, I want to tell you some statistics here. Before the war, there were 7,719 Army nurses. At the war's end, there were 44,802. That's a lot of statistics. There were 201 nurses who died during the war. 16 were killed in enemy action. 66 Army and 11 Navy nurses endured three years of Japanese torture after the fall of the Philippines something that isn't usually discussed. In the early days of the war, the, that's in the 42, there were no uniforms issued. The girls were issued men's uniforms, men's sizes. There were none for the nurses. And of course, it was better when I got in. I got in in May of 1944. I was a student nurse when Pearl Harbor broke out. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, I made up my mind then that this is what it's gonna be. I am nervous. <laughs> God, I practiced and practiced anyway. <laughs> I can talk like a fool when I'm alone. <laughs> okay, well, let's get going here. I know we've got to be through by 9 o'clock, right? I went to Camp McCoy for my induction. We were issued gear. We had some basic training, not a lot, because we were trained in our profession. But the biggest thing we found out that we had no conception of combat wounds and shock treatment. So this was a big thing for us to learn, and we didn't learn it until we got overseas and got busy. Alrighty, we were assigned to units at Camp McCoy, and I was so thrilled to be assigned to the European Theater. I'm scared to death of snakes, and I was worried sick I'd go to the Pacific. So I was thrilled I was in Europe. I was in Europe, and I was assigned to the 101st General Hospital, which is another good deal. The gals that served in the evac hospitals and some of the station hospitals had a rough deal. We in the general hospitals usually took care of convalescent patients. We, uh, I'll go into it later, but anyhow, I'll tell you right now. We got on a ship in June of 44 on the SS West Point, went across the ocean. We zigzagged at the time. We had no convoys at that time. The ship was fast enough so that I understand a submarine could not sight it in that length of time. They zigzagged every three minutes or six minutes. I forget which it was. But anyway, that was the story. We, as nurses, were down at the bottom deck. There were no doors in case we were torpedoed. So when we slept, we slept stacked. I think there were 30 of us in the room. No doors. We uh, had to be exposed to the uh, GIs who were fed 24 hours a day. This was a troop ship. And they would be out in the hall. And when they saw there were nurses in this room, heaven forbid, they took their mess kits and they rattled and rattled and rattled. We had no sleep, 24 hours no sleep. But anyhow, we enjoyed it. <laughs> we got a big kick out of it. Okay, we, um, we uh, went overseas. We ended uh, up in Scotland and boarded trains and came down to a small town of Taunton, which is a town that is smaller than Rensselaer. Now, you've got to visualize England. England is an awful small country. And with the vast number of troops that were settled there, you can imagine we used anything and everything for hospitals. They didn't have enough hospitals for us. So we used buildings, we had tents and open areas, anything and everything. We were lucky enough to get some English barracks. Lucky. They were brown barns scattered in several different directions. We looked at these things and thinking, we've got to make a hospital out of this unit. Or we'll leave it to American ingenuity. They did. We scrubbed, we cleaned, we stocked, we put cots up, and they built ramps, covered ramps between each one of these buildings, and we called them spiders. So we could facilitate taking patients to x-ray to surgery without exposing them to the weather, because we didn't have corridors. We had all of these separate buildings. So this was one thing that, excuse me, that we did. The operating room was a Quonset hut, and so was the x-ray. And food was transported from a from a station kitchen with hot carts down these ramps to the kitchens in every spider. And that's how we fed the patients. Well, the transportation of hospital patients, you'll probably want to know, how did we get our patients? Here we are stuck in the middle of nowhere in a small town of Taunton. We got our patients on C-47s. 
These are planes that usually went to the continent, loaded with bags of luggage, supplies to the soldiers, and came back with patients. And as a result, we had quite a few patients. They were picked up with ambulances and then transferred to our area, brought to this Quonset hut where the doctor stood and evaluated each patient as he came in. And they would tell us whether or not this patient needed immediate care or he would be able to be convalescing for a while before he could be taken care of. Now mind you, this is the wonderful thing. Our boys were in our hospitals, I get choked up, within seven hours of being hurt. They were flown over within that time. So you can imagine how tickled they were to get in. <laughs> Excuse me, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> so, let me tell you about Taunton. Us nurses were stationed in a manor house. Well, this manor house was a lovely old English building up on a hill. It used to take us about 20 minutes to walk down to the spiders. And of course, the poor second lieutenants were up in the attic, where the, uh, evidently where the servants used to live. The captain and the first lieutenants lived on the second floor. It's a beautiful home, beautiful curving staircase, beautiful ballroom, gorgeous. We had one fireplace in our room, one fireplace. And this old English man with his hobnail boots would come up and bring you a one cold scuttle. <laughs> that should last you all day. Cold, we were so cold we couldn't stand it. Downstairs, the, the lieutenants and the captains had central heating. <laughs> so one night, we decided we wanted another scuttle of coal. So there was this back entryway that used to go down to the kitchen. So my roommate and I decided we're going to go steal some coal. So down we went with the coal scuttle, down to the coal pile outside. It was snowing. We filled the darn thing up, and we got too greedy. We filled it up too full. So as we're going up the stairs, bong, 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 <laughs> bong, coal was falling down. We thought, my god, the whole thing is good. We're going to be found. We're going to be court-martialed. But we did. We heated up our little room and we, we managed to survive. And getting back to Doris's story, the V2s were hitting about that time. And I have an English newspaper here. The V2s gave no warning. All of a sudden, a neighborhood would be hit, a school. And here's a Woolworth store where it's an old English newspaper. And you can come up and see it later. Uh, there were no air, air, air sirens, no air alerts. These things just came over out of a clear blue sky. They sounded like an old uh, washing machine, they say. They had the most distinctive sound there ever That's was. That's what they used to you say. You ever heard one, you if could you hear know one it. more 30 years later, and you'd know yeah. what it was. Now that thing is from, let's see, that, that paper is from uh, April 27, 1945, and we are already in Berlin. You can see it. You're welcome to see it when you want to come up. Okay, Dunkel, let's go on here. I have to take notes because I'm not as organized as Doris is. Uh, okay, like I said, the patients were with, admitted within seven hours of being hurt in the field. They were brought in, and we really got our feet wet. We got 1,300 patients at one slew. There were 80 nurses in our outfit. Each nurse had two corpsmen working with her. So you can imagine, the wards were 50 beds. They were just cots, like army cots. These boys came in and they were dirty. They were still in their uniforms. And uh, you can just imagine, we had to undress them. We had to dress them, we had to bathe them. And we just had no time to take care of their uniforms and their helmets and their guns. And they would just go under the beds. And we thought, we'll take care of it later. Well, what they do in the Quebec hospitals when a patient is hurt, they'll dress the wound and then they'll put a plaster cast on it. And that immobilized the, the limb until they came to us. So all these plaster casts had to be removed. So the fellows, the GIs, were going crazy with these big, you've seen these big plaster cutters, cutting these things away. And along would come the doctors with another corpsman and dress all these people. Well, that took us three days, and nobody slept. It was something to see. Well, the boys, you know, oh, I knew I'd do this, darn it. <laughs> you know, you're going to erase some of this stuff, aren't you? Please. <laughs> okay. And while you probably are curious to see what kind of wounds these boys had, mostly gunshot wounds. Most of them were shrapnel. You know what shrapnel is? When it bursts, they get these little pieces of metal all over their bodies and their backs, and these things have a tendency to work out. They get, like, a little head on them and you could just pop them, and out would come the metal. And this would take several weeks, you know, to do. Uh, then, of course, uh, I'll have to tell you about an accident that, that uh, happened on my ward. 
I'm not on my word, but on another word. Uh, his name was Wally. And they kept talking about Wally. And Wally had hit a mine with a jeep. And both of his legs were involved. And the nurses on the other ward were telling me they were just so upset about him and so worried about him. And one day, I picked, walked over to that ward to pick the, one of the nurses up to go eat, because we had to walk a mile to eat. It was at night. We're on night duty. We had 12-hour shifts. I walked in there, and here I hear, I know you. I walked down there, and Wally was a kid across the street. <laughs> and it's funny, because I, I wrote to my dad immediately and told him to go over there. And Wally was really banged up. And they shipped him home, airy back. And uh, we found him later in Chicago, and he had a florist shop. The, G the Army set him up in a florist shop. So, but anyhow, that was quite an incident for me to walk in there and, and see this kid. And he was really hurt, but he was grinning. He was just great, just great. Okay, we censored mail for the patients. The patients could write home. And uh, guess who had to censor the mail? We did. And we had to read all these love letters. <laughs> Some of them were pretty hot. <laughs> and I went to a Catholic nursing school. <laughs> wow. So I signed my little name at the end of it, but then I had to walk down the ward and look at that guy. At the <laughs> they never knew. We never told them. But that's what we did. All right, another injury that we don't uh, think of very often is uh, we had a psycho ward. We had battle fatigue patients. They weren't really psychos, they were just worn out. And we had accumulated quite a ward of these boys. The more serious ones were put in another room, but these boys were all put on insulin shock therapy. In other words, we put all of them on a certain amount of insulin, and they were like zombies, and we were trying to, they were trying to erase the memory of battle. So the corpsman had to take each individual boy to the urinal, bring them back, take them to the shower, bring them back, feed them, make sure he ate, it was quite an ordeal. I really don't know how successful it was. I never cared for a psychiatrist, so I don't know. <laughs> but guess who got locked up in the little room? Me, with the patients. <laughs> I had 12 patients at a Corman, and I'll tell you, it was a very rewarding experience. Those fellows were wonderful. They were all being shipped back home. They were worried about the impressions they would have at home. How would their parents feel? How would their wives feel? Would they feel they're nuts? Would they feel like crazy? And for all intents and purposes, these boys needed more psychiatric care. But we would go in there. We'd have the door locked behind us. I'd have the key. And we'd play the radio. We'd play games. We'd dance. And if someone got a little squirrely, they would usually come up to me and say, hey, Lieutenant, lock me up. I don't feel so great. And I'd put them in the padded cell. And I thought that was super, because it just took one patient to throw everybody else in here. If one boy flipped his lid, the whole ward would go nuts, and you'd really have yourself a time. But it was a wonderful experience, like I say. But these boys, we had to accumulate them till we had enough for a plane load. So it took a while. We kept them for quite some time. And it was really, really quite an experience. And I wondered how their parents felt when they got home and how their wives felt. Most of them were worried about the wives. It was a closed ward, and there was an occasional hysteria, but it was mostly depression. That's what it was. <coughs> Okay, a special day that I have marked here with the Battle of the Bulge. And that door spoke to you. That happened to us. And we had patients arrive on Christmas Eve. We went to church, went to Mass. We no sooner got back to our quarters when the phone started ringing. And the, we could see the ambulances taken off for the airstrip. And they brought in a full load of patients. And what a wonderful day to be there. They got fed, they, got fed, they had wonderful meals. They had turkey and dressing and everything you could think of. Uh, so grateful to be there, and we were grateful they were there. It was a wonderful Christmas, wonderful Christmas. Uh, so then we made the E Day came in May. I'm trying to hurry this up a little bit. Uh, and we were still in England. We got secret orders, and we thought, secret orders, where are we going? Are we going to be split up? We had been with these kids for a while, with these corpsmen. We had become quite close. Well, we didn't know where we were going. So uh, they put us on a train, and we went into uh, Paris. We got into Paris and they cordoned us off. We couldn't move out of the station. The war was over. There were no trains. There was maybe one train operating every three, four hours. We'd have to wait till there was a train going in the direction that we were going. And all of a sudden this train pulls up and they're unloading 
people in white and black striped pajamas. And we thought, what is that? We couldn't have had skinny, dirty, and Red Cross workers were working around them and loading the litters. And we couldn't imagine, so we asked one of them. They broke through to one of the camps and they were unloading the Jewish prisoners in Paris. And if everyone said it didn't happen, I saw it, it happened. It was terrible. So I feel very strongly that these people that oppose the Holocaust, I don't know how they could, how they could do that, because we've seen it. We saw those patients, but it was at least 100 of them being unloaded. We had to wait in order to get on the train. <coughs> uh, they were liberated from a concentration camp. I can't believe, I, I don't know the name of it. I don't have it here. If I knew it, I have forgotten it. After loading on the train, the men were in boxcars. The women, as girls, were in these compartments. You see them on the movies, where there's a sliding glass door. You know, there's a long haul. Well, we were in fatigues. There was one girl on one side of the, of the, the room, the other girl on the other, a girl in the middle on the floor, and a girl out in the hall. And that's how we drove to Germany. Bathing, we waited till the train stopped, and we ran up to the steam locomotive, and we filled our helmets with the hot water from the steam. <coughs> it took us three days to get to Germany. Bathroom facilities, boys on the left, girls on the right. <laughs> and it worked. Uh, I'm trying to see here, after loading on the train uh, and, and going through Germany, we couldn't help but see the devastation, like Dora said, and the people in throngs were waiting at the stations trying to cop a train with all their belongings on their back. Their, their homes were all bombed. There was devastation everywhere. There wasn't a street in Berlin that hadn't been touched. Not a street, but at this time, we didn't know we were going into Berlin. We were the first general hospital in Berlin. We were the first ones to set up a hospital in Berlin. So we were really proud to do that. But we were, at first, our headquarters are to see here. Uh, we set up in a schoolhouse. They pulled all the desks out of the schools. And remember the sliding uh, blackboards? And anybody remember a schoolhouse like that? We had them in the city. You'd, ha you'd pull up the blackboards and that's where all your coats were hung. Well, that's the type of, of uh, schoolhouse this was. And we were admitting patients. We were admitting children that had been playing with incendiary bombs and they were being hurt. They had nowhere to go. Their, their hospitals were all devastated. They had no place to go. We were bathing patients and using water out of the janitorial sinks. All those big sinks that they have, this is what we had. Dumping bedpans in these little toilets that the kids used. And it was uh, pretty tough going there. And the toughest part was when a real friend, good friend of mine, his name was Vince, was an MP. And at that time in Berlin, the Russians were still there and they were allowed to carry sidearms. And I don't know if any of you fellows were stationed in that area. Our, our guys did not have sidearms. The, the Russians did. You couldn't touch them. And they had run into an apartment and caused a disturbance, and the MPs came in to quiet it down. Well, the Germans opened fire, and Vince got it in both legs. And Vince was a big man. He was over six foot, and he was probably 300 pounds. And we had to take care of him in this schoolroom. And we had to use two mattresses, because he was just broke bulging with those, big, uh, those little skinny mattresses. And he bled. We had to move his. I think we had to change his mattresses two, three times a day. His wound was very bad. They, uh, they were worried sick they'd have to uh, amputate his leg. We waited and waited. And um, he was starting to be a priest, but he could cuss like a trooper. And our chaplain would come in there and he'd say, Vince, there isn't anybody in purgatory. You got everybody out of there with your cussing. And we'd all kid him. And one day we were real serious, we, were, we, we had to bathe them. They said, please, don't roll me over. We said, we have to. Your back is, is in bad shape. We have to roll you over. And my word boy at that time was called Tasho. And Tasho had a nose that's bigger than mine. <laughs> and he was a uh, Portuguese. He came from, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the town he came from. I can't remember anymore. But anyhow, he was a ward boy, just a simple guy, real cute guy. And he was helping me bathe Vince. And Vince was looking at me all again. He said, who want to marry me? He said, look at me, I won't have a leg. Who want to marry me? And old Tasha spoke up. And he said, hell, my father hasn't got a leg, and he's got six kids. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing he could have 
said, I thought, gosh, Tasha, you know, out of the stupid comes wisdom, you know, because, oh, what a wonderful thing to say, and, and Vince couldn't help but break into a smile. <laughs> and we took care of Vince until we shipped him to Paris, and he wrote back to us, and he said, hey, there's nothing like the 101, you see, wish you were back. <laughs> anyway, we got uh, him taken care of, and I, I haven't heard from him as a civilian, but I would sure like to. Uh, we were uh, quartered in people's homes, which was kind of sad. We uh, went into a neighborhood and had everybody move out. Now this was two or three bedroom homes, little cottages. We were all around the schoolhouse. And you can imagine how these people felt. They had to leave everything behind. We had a sign for things. They moved, took their clothing, and the nurses were quartered in these homes. The boys were quartered in apartment houses. And we often wondered if we didn't see people sneaking around at night, peeking in the windows to see if we didn't hurt their things. And for the most part, I think things were the same when we left. We moved to Temple Hall, which was near Temple Hall Fairfield. And it was a TV sanitary. And there was a hospital. We finally set up beds and, and operated as a hospital. We had our own operating rooms. Things were going pretty good. Uh, I mean, everything changed for me because we were a uh, hospital of occupation. We were, we were with an army of occupation. And things changed. Our type of prisoners were different. I had political prisoners for patients. They were defiant. They had been in camps and they all got dysentery. They all were sick. They were older men, uh, demanding. When are my American Red Cross rations going to be here? Uh, all that type of thing. And then we had some German soldiers that had been, uh, I don't know why they were um, in camps, but they were, especially a young one that I remember. He had been using a coffee urn and had dumped the whole urn of hot water on him and had been burned terribly. And we had German women working around the, the wards. They would sweep and clean him out. And they tended to take care of this boy. And we really worked with him. And we lost him. But those women just were just felt terrible because, uh, you know, he was young, blonde, probably in his early 20s. And so they came with a cross one day. And they said, when they take him to bury him, will you, will you put this cross there for him? And also, I had nothing to do with that. But we handed it over to the German you know, people that were there. And I'm sure they took care of him. Uh, first Christmas in Berlin was real sad. I was going out dinner. Boys had eaten. I asked if they wanted seconds. Mm -hmm, not particularly. Uh, the women were in the kitchen. The German women were cleaning up. And what they would do is remember these big fruit juice cans that you see in the kitchen. They would take these and they'd save them. And th they didn't think I knew, but I knew. And they would scrape all the food fill these cans, pass them over the, the fence to waiting people to take home to feed their families. They were all starving. It was cold. They were living in bombed out apartments. They had children. So I decided to go into the ward and I asked the fellows, I said, look, we have five cleaning ladies and they're going home tonight is Christmas Eve and they don't have anything. And they're in the kitchen crying. And I said, how about passing five paper bags and seeing what we can give them? Now we had 50 guys there. We got five bags for candy you know, toothpaste, soap. Soap was a big thing for the Germans. They didn't have any at all. But they filled five sacks for their Christmas, and they went home <laughs> with these bags, and they were so thrilled. So the kids had a Christmas. And it was, it was great, just great. Then after that comes Korea. Well, Aug, are you going to Korea? Well, yeah. Well, they took my name off the list. I did go to Korea. <laughs> I came home. I came home on the, on the on the ship in January, and I'm like Doris, I barfed with every wave. I was sick all the way. And like I say, I am rather rushing this. I, uh, it's quarter two. Is there anything that you want to know that I may have missed? Doc, got anything to ask me? <laughs> I ought to tell you about our camp. These boys got this camp rigged up. We had a movie theater. We had a PX. We had, um, the boys could roam around their bathrobes on, they could go, uh, they were free to do whatever they had to do, providing they checked in with the nurse. They had passes to town if they were able to. They had to be in at a certain time. And uh, I have a favorite story about passes. I had Lieutenant Smith from Southern Illinois, and I don't know where he's at now, but he was a real sweet, mild man. He was a teacher. And he was the most cooperative young man, just did whatever the nurses asked him to do. And he had a pass. Came back. Well, first of all, I made bed check. Smith wasn't there. And I thought, uh-oh. Well, each one of these buildings had a big double door at the back, just like a barn would have. 
And I thought, my God, he's going to get it. I had lights out. We had to have lights out at 10 o'clock, just like children. And um, I hear the door squeak. Well, here comes Smitty, drunker than the Lord. I don't think he ever had a drink in his life. And he had gone to the kitchen and had bribed the Chinese cook there for some hot dogs. And he had this whole string of hot dogs. And he was traipping down the ward taking everybody's temperature. He's all, be to take your temperature. And everybody was just in stitches because he, he, it's just so unlike him, you know. <laughs> ah, so, yeah, like I say, it was a great world. Yeah. You can tell us about that Christmas tree. Oh, and... geez. Somebody would remember that story. <laughs> what's your, what's Are we have all adults in here? <laughs> I First Christmas. Where'd you pick Joe up? Oh, I knew him. Oh, you did? Yeah. But first Christmas in Berlin, okay? I'm in my ward. No Christmas tree. So I hear about this great Christmas tree next door, and I thought, hey, where'd the guys get it? Well, they went into somebody's front yard and just cut off a tree. But they said, you should see it, Olga. It's great. And I said, really? So I my board man, who was a sergeant, said, come on, I'll walk over with you. So I walked over there, and I looked at this tree, and I thought, geez, that neat. And of course, 50 guys, you know. And Olga walks up to this tree and says, oh, and where did you get the ornaments? They're really super. God, they look great. And everybody's snickering. Up come the covers over the heads. You won't believe what they did. They blew up condoms. <laughs> <laughs> and they rolled them in glue. And they rolled them in... Magnesium sulfate or Epsom salts. And they just glittered as pretty as you can be. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And I started to give me a poke, and I thought, what are you poking me for, you know? And everybody's in hysterics. Well, that story got around the hospital in 10 minutes. All I got doesn't know an ornament when she sees it. Hey, I went to a Catholic hospital, I told you. I don't know any other stories to tell you people except that this, the patients were just super. They would help one another if the nurses were busy. It was not unlike the patient in the next bed to get up, offer him a drink of water, take his urinal to, to the bathroom and empty it. Uh, and of course the nurses had to take a lot of ripping. You had to have a good sense of humor in the army or else you were done. You were done. If you didn't, it was absolutely gone. I had one episode that, uh, I know that I had a little hot temper. I was making the beds in this ward, and I went to this lieutenant. He was the only one that wasn't up. And I said, come on, lieutenant, out, let's go. Let's go to the showers. I have to make your bed. And he kind of read me out in no uncertain terms. And I looked, and of course, I was you know, rather stunned. And I stomped out <laughs> and ran into my captain, and she, the nurse. And she said, what's the matter? And I said, this was an officer's ward, OK. And I said, I'm never going back in there again. I said, I don't want to have anything to do with those guys. I want to go back into a GI ward. I don't want to be with these people. And I was just, what, 23, you know, young girl. And I was just in tears. I walked out, and pretty soon, here comes a major, real nice man. He says, Lieutenant, I want you to come back in the ward. And I said, never, never, I'm never going to go back in the ward. He said, I want you to come into the ward. And he came, brought me in, and he had this other lieutenant stand there and apologized to me in front of all the fellows. Wow. And I thought that was pretty great. <laughs> and I did get another award. <laughs> the Psycho Award. <laughs> they thought I was fit for that. And I had a lot of fun with those guys. In fact, they used to want to lock me up. <laughs> we had good times. Yep, the American GI was a wonderful patient, just a wonderful patient. And the American hospitals treated them great. They had great food. They were clean, they were dry, they were, they were treated very well. I think we were very proud of them. And like I say, this, is, this cannot compare to what the girls had in the event hospitals who were up there right behind the lines. That was tough duty, really tough duty. They were dirty, they were wet, they were not fed as well as we were, and it was really hard. But like I say, I was lucky I lucked out. I was stationed at a station hospital for a while in the 250th, I can remember the name. And we lived in tents. We worked in tents. And that's quite a, quite a deal. You've seen MASH. And this was like it was. We had to go out, take a shower, walk back to the nurses' quarters. The fellows would all be, patients would all have, be sitting outside the tents and making all kinds of cracks, you know. You just had to go on your merry way. We had our pajamas, and we used our coat liners for, for bathrobes. The Army was very clever with clothes. And uh, so we were treating with our head up, with our heads wrapped up in towels, and they thought that was really neat. But uh, nursing in a tent was really something. You can imagine, you know, bathing a patient, changing the bed. It was really difficult to do. 
And yet, this is how England had to do. England just did not have enough room for all the Americans that were there and all the Americans that were coming back. So, anything you want to ask me? How about all that laundry? We had a laundry. We had our own laundry. Uh -huh. We had our own laundry, our own kitchen. They baked their own bread. It was real interesting. Yep, and those, those carts would come down. And the kitchen was so far away that those of us that worked nights didn't feel like going up there at midnight to eat. So we eat the bread. We all gained a lot of weight because we eat the bread and English marmalade and peanut butter. That was our. That was our. If we didn't feel like going down to the mess hall to eat, that's what we ate. But uh, it was uh, all in Germany again in Berlin. I have to hop around. My memory is not as good as Norris's. Uh, the Russians were there, okay, and I'm Ukrainian, and I can speak a little Russian, a little Ukrainian. I can understand, and the. Uh, the Russians would come and they'd want to entertain our troops with their little concertinas, you know, we wouldn't let them in the ward, we used to argue with them. But they used to want penicillin. They all had problems with that. Uh, and we did too. The army of occupation, like I said, our patients changed. I had the POWs, but my girlfriend had the VD ward. And the saddest thing is, is when you saw men of your outfit come in with VD. Uh, army occupation is tough duty, and these boys have been away from home a long time. And my nurse friend that had this war and had the darnest, uh, what do I want to say, uh, not a mural, but a poster. And it was Donald Duck. And he's real mad. You know how mad he gets? And his little hat was flying in the air, and he was real red. And he said, I tell you, Doc, I got it off the toilet seat. <laughs> Charles Stapp and Gerald Pettit. Gerald's been here for both of the uh, meetings so far, and these men were both stationed in Europe and saw too much action, and we hope that their stories will have a very special meaning for each of you. Dr. Kenny, is there anything else this evening? Just uh, if you would turn in your notes, those of you that will. Jeff will take them at the door. I'll get it taken. Yeah, I think Phil, you know, good speakers tell stories. And we've heard two marvelous speakers. But I promise, still, I won't go to sleep tonight. I'll be thinking about all this. I really need yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. because it wouldn't be right to break up such a good meeting before 9 o'clock. Is there anything that anybody would like to ask or suggest or uh, add anything to these meetings? We would like... Yes, Ms. Ayler? I have a question for Olga. Yes, ma'am. Doris talked about her return and how people talked to her directly and how she was treated. Right. And how well, it might sound a little pretentious, but no, I don't think the nurses had that problem. But I do think the wax did. I really do. Uh, because we just went right into work. You know, there was lots of work waiting for us in, in civilian life. And no, I don't think we, we, we had that problem. Uh, I didn't, you know, and I don't think anyone else that I know did. I, I feel like Doris, though, I felt like, what are these people talking about? Why are they so, you know, nonsensical? I don't think, I don't think they felt the impact that we felt. I don't think they saw the suffering that we saw, and we thought how foolish they were, you know, how empty-headed they were. Uh, I think I had that impression. Naive. Yeah, and very naive, very naive. And I think a lot of the fellows felt that way too when they came home, you know, and they'd seen a lot of. And like I said, you know, and I, when we used to send the boys, they used to come in and, and they were recuperated. A lot of them went back to duty. They didn't all go home. And I used to say, nobody needs two Purple Hearts. 
Nobody needs to go back to duty and get another perfect heart. You used to hate to see them go. Because you knew that in most chances, a lot of them would come back with another wound. A lot of them went back to duty. And that was surprising to me. You know? See, we were as a general hospital, we kept them long enough to recuperate. And back they went if they could. Also, most often, if we were told, if we said we were in the military, they said, oh, you're a nurse. Yeah, yeah, for they some reason, yeah. If you were in the military, you were a nurse. Mm -hmm. For some and reason, a woman's army nurse. Well, we're all worried. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that, you know, you're right. I think, you know, it was terribly undermined. And, and as far as women in combat are concerned, when I think what we went through on that train trip going to Berlin, being dirty, not having our hair washed, of course, maybe the Army's different now, and that probably is. I don't think a woman belongs in combat. I really don't. Physically. She just isn't compatible for combat. Because I can't go into details, but if you think how uncomfortable we were sometimes when we couldn't get a bath, it was tough. And I would think that that could happen to women in combat. It would be really hard. We're physically just not able to do it. You went to California afterwards. Yes. Well, the feeling was different with the nurses. I think it was just a registration. See, when California was very uppity. They, the reciprocity wasn't there. Florida and California did not accept Illinois nurses. They didn't think we had enough training. So it was tough. But I worked for Shriners for Crippled Children, so I had a pretty decent job. Then. But on the whole, that was, those were two tough states to get into. But we did not, like she said, if they, she said they were in the Army, they did say you were a nurse. And that's, that is strange, you know, the women in the Army Corps did not get enough recognition in that field. They didn't. They really didn't. And you did a wonderful job. I was so much more nervous than you were. <laughs> I am. I'm too emotional. You know? <laughs> I'm too emotional. I get to thinking about things, you know, and I think, geez, you know, I see these guys and see these things, and, and I do. I get too emotional. Well, it was, it's, uh, yeah, you'd be a good nurse, you got to be emotional, right? You've got to. You've got to feel for them. And uh, that, that's, that's part of it. Bob and I got to go home and look up the reciprocities or whatever that word you said. <laughs> Reciprocity? Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, another state saying you can come and work here. We will accept oh, your credits. Okay. In other words, when, where you went to school, your credits are okay. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> it wasn't a dirty word. <laughs> Question here. No, it's a personal comment. I've had the privilege of being a nurse's aide under Olga and then a nurse under Olga, with Olga. She was an excellent nurse in civilian life, just as she was in her army life. And I'm sure her army life is what made her the civilian nurse that she has been. Oh, listen to that. I'm proud of you. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Olga ran a tight ship. <laughs> yeah, I ran a tight ship. She still does. <laughs> Friends, we would be very interested if anybody has any suggestions to make concerning the series. Any way that we can upgrade it, any way that we can improve it, we'd like to hear from you. Arnold? Uh, one one suggestion, uh, suggestion I have. I don't know if you can borrow uh, one of those auctioneers' microphones or that. There's many of us that have maybe one good ear. <laughs> And with your silent tones, as well as some of the speakers, I think it would be easier listening if there was some way to amplify it. Do you think uh, without a, a uh, sound system, would there be any advantage if the participant were in the middle of the room? No. Maybe. Yeah. I considered that. Yes, that would be good. And all we need to do is take that pillar out of there. <laughs> But I appreciate I know, the suggestion. Uh, no, the, the average age that you have here, uh, uh, not, not everybody wants to admit that they can't hear people. <laughs> I'm, one, I'm one that admitted. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let me tell you about Phil Wood. Last Thursday night, I got up here and I thought I was yelling. I did. I thought I was yelling because I was always taught to just look over people's heads and talk to the guy way out there at the far end of the hall. 
And I happened to glance over here at Gene Smith, and he had his <laughs> hand up to his ear. I wasn't speaking loud enough, so the acoustics aren't great in here. But uh, maybe we could kind of wrap these chairs around or just face them to the center and the speaker locate here in the center somewhere. You have to be more nervous than that. I'll turn that over to Dr. Kim. <laughs> That's your problem. Okay, let's break it up and we'll see you next Thursday night, hopefully. Good night. Good night.